in many cases when people build models like Parafac and similar models they use constraints uh, to make sure that the parameters are meaningful in the context so for example consider that you are building a PCA model for example you're getting scores and loadings and normally when you do PCA the loadings for example are going to be orthogonal as exemplified up here in a spectral data set well that's perfectly fine but maybe you would prefer loadings that looked a little bit more physical so what you could do alternatively would be to say that you would like to fit data using scores and loadings but you would also like that the scores and loadings be non-negative for example so that would make sure that your loadings came out non-negative if we talk about something like two-way curve resolution like multivariate curve resolution it's really essential to use constraints like this to get meaningful models in freeway data we don't always need that as very often our models will just come out non-negative if the underlying spectra are non-negative but sometimes we can use constraints to make sure that the model is accurate or to make sure that certain problems are handled and we'll see some examples of that so what can we do with constraints well actually quite a bit we can make sure that our parameters are just sensible imagine I'm estimating illusion profiles I really only want my illusion profiles to have one peak I don't want illusion profiles with three peaks in and I can make sure I get that by applying unimodality on my chromatographic profiles sometimes in non-unique models I can make non-unique models by specifying areas that I know are selective where all but one component are absent I can do that by fixing my loadings to be zero I can use constraints to for example check if a tryptophan spectrum would be an adequate model or a spectrum to include in a model I can also use constraints to avoid numerical problems for example I can use non-negativity to avoid two-factor degeneracies because in a two-factor degeneracy one model has to be the negative one component has to be the negative of another component and they cannot be that if I impose non-negativity I can also use constraints for for example speeding up algorithms by compressing the data in certain ways or even for handling quanti quantitative data uh, in a uh, qualitative data in a quantitative manner for example so that different are many possibilities of using constraints for various things in a sort of a more chemical context we can say that very often we know something about auto or cross correlation of our data for example spectroscopic data would have cross correlations uh, neighboring compound neighboring wavelengths would be correlated we often know something about the uncertainty of our data and we can use that in our algorithms to make sure that the algorithm focus on the accurate parts we definitely often know that our parameters are non-negative sometimes unimodal only have one peak etc etc and when you think about it there's often quite a bit that we know about the data and we can impose most of that in our models as constraints here's an example I'm not going to talk too much about the actual data but more about all the things we know about the data the data come from a flow injection analysis system and it consists of different um, samples that contain three different acids so two three and four HBA here's a typical sample in this particular flow injection system there's a pH gradient across the sample so that means that while the sample passes the detector the pH will change from acidic to basic and that's the reason that the samples uh, will look quite complex because while passing through the flow injection system they go from their acidic to their basic form depending on their pKa value 
So really what we see is that we see a time profile, but it's really the sum of the profile of the acidic and the basic analyte. And likewise, at any time points, we see a spectrum, but it's really the sum of an acidic and a basic spectrum. Now, this is an interesting system because there's quite a bit that we know about uh, this data set. So, for example, the time profile is going to be the same for all samples because in flow injection analysis, it's just diffusion. So, so the shape of the time profile will always be the same. Not the underlying ones, but the sum of the acidic and the basic is going to be constant. We also know that these profiles are non-negative. We actually also know that in the beginning there's only acidic. So, so we have a selective system where there's no basic analyte present. The model that we're using is not exactly perfect, but it's pretty close. It's called Paralint. I'm not going to talk about that in detail, but it's special because for every sample we have a concentration. So we have three different concentrations. But for every sample we have two time profiles and two spectra. So one concentration, but two time profiles and two uh, set of spectra. And that makes it a little bit different from uh, Parafact. But that's not the important part here. The important part here is all the things we know about the data and that we can impose as constraints. We're going to estimate the concentrations, the free concentrations for every sample. We're going to estimate the time profiles and we're going to estimate the underlying spectra. And there are going to be six of those and six of the time profiles. This is just a little mathematical thing that makes sure that the free concentrations are related to the six time and uh, spectral profiles. Okay. What we do know is that the time profile, acidic and basic, will sum to a constant shape. So no matter what sample we have, the sum of them will always be the same shape. We can impose that in a model as an equality constraint. We also know that all parameters are non-negative. We can impose that as a non-negativity constraint. We also know that time profiles are unimodal. If a sample, acidic sample, appears and starts disappearing, it doesn't appear again. So we can impose that as a unimodality constraint. And finally, we can impose the pure acidic and basic time points by fixing certain elements to zero. So you see that all the chemical knowledge we have can be imposed as mathematical constraints in the model, restrictions on the parameters. And if we do that, we can look at how well we model the data. So for example, we can look at how well our estimated concentrations will correlate to the true ones. And here you can see that as a function of adding more and more constraints. And what you will see is that the more constraints we add, the better the correlation will be, approximately. But it's quite consistent that you improve the model by adding more constraints. And that makes perfect sense. If we add reasonable constraints, they will lead to a lower variability, so they will improve our model. Not by much, we can see, but we do get an improvement. We can do the same for the spectra and have a look at how well does the model actually model the six spectra, two for each analyte. And again, we see the same thing. The more constraints we add, the better we recover the underlying spectra, approximately. And in addition, actually, we have some kind of non-uniqueness in this model because we have two spectra for every chemical, an acidic and a basic one. But the more constraint we add, the more unique, so to speak, the model is. And the star here indicates the non-uniqueness. And we are eliminating the non-uniqueness by adding more and more constraints. So that's another added benefit that we have in case of non-unique models, that they can benefit from adding uh, constraints.